Welcome to Native History, the channel where we cover important topics to Native history, the history of the first people to live on this continent. Today we'll be looking at a very famous figure from Native American history, namely Sequoia. Who was Sequoia? Sequoia, born around 1770 and passing away in 1843, may, best known, may be best known today for being the namesake of a particular tree in California, but he was actually a prominent Native American figure known for his extraordinary contributions to the Cherokee Nation. A member of the Cherokee, he was the son of a Cherokee mother and a European-American father. Although he did not receive any formal education, Sequoia possessed remarkable ingenuity and perseverance that would lead him to become a respected leader and an influential linguist. He is most renowned for creating the Cherokee Syllabary, a groundbreaking writing system that facilitated literacy and communication among the Cherokee people. Growing up in the Cherokee town of Tuskegee, in what is now Tennessee, Sequoia was a skilled silversmith and blacksmith. He fought alongside the Cherokee in the Creek War, which took place from 1813 to 1814, and during this time, he observed the usefulness of written communication among Euro-American soldiers. Inspired by this, Sequoia embarked on a journey to create a writing system that would enable the Cherokee people to read, write, and preserve their own language. For 12 years, Sequoia dedicated his time and energy to developing the Cherokee syllabary. His initial attempts to create a character-based system, similar to Chinese writing, proved to be too complex. Eventually, he simplified the writing system by creating characters that represented syllables rather than individual sounds. The resulting syllabary consisted of 86 characters, each representing a distinct sound in the Cherokee language. Upon completing the syllabary in 1821, Sequoia faced skepticism from the Cherokee community. As many were doubtful that his writing system would work. To demonstrate the efficacy of the syllabary, Sequoia taught his daughter, Ayoka, to read and write using the new system. This proved to be a turning point, as the tribe began to recognize the potential of the syllabary. The Cherokee nation quickly adopted the writing system, and within a few years, thousands of Cherokee people had learned to read and write using his syllabary. The adoption of the Cherokee syllabary led to an unprecedented level of literacy among the Cherokee people. The ability to read and write in their own language greatly strengthened the Cherokee nation, fostering a sense of unity and pride in their cultural identity. In 1828, the Cherokee nation began publishing a bilingual newspaper called the Cherokee Phoenix, which was written in both Cherokee and English. The newspaper played a vital role in disseminating news, promoting education, and preserving Cherokee culture and history. Sequoia's achievements did not go unnoticed, and he received widespread recognition and admiration for his creation of the Cherokee syllabary. In 1824, the Cherokee Nation honored Sequoia by awarding him a silver medal, which he wore proudly for the rest of his life. His name Sequoia was also given to the giant Sequoia tree, Sequoia Dendron Giganteum, and the Sequoia National Park in California as a testament to his lasting impact on the Cherokee people and the world. Sequoia was an exceptional figure who left an indelible mark on the Cherokee Nation and the history of Native Americans. His creation of the syllabary revolutionized the way Cherokee people communicated, preserved their language, and fostered a sense of cultural unity and pride. Today, he stands as an enduring symbol of innovation, determination, and the importance of preserving cultural heritage. So that's a quick overview of his life, but let's put him in the context of Cherokee history overall. In the century leading up to Sequoia's life, the Cherokee people experienced significant changes and challenges. The Cherokee Nation, one of the five civilized tribes, originally inhabited a vast territory covering parts of present-day Alabama, Georgia, North and South Carolina, and Tennessee. With a complex social structure, the Cherokee people had a matrilineal society, with clans playing a crucial role in their daily lives. During the 17th and 18th centuries, European settlers began to encroach upon Cherokee lands. This period saw an increase in trade and contact between the Cherokee people and Europeans, primarily the British and the French. The Cherokee forged alliances with various European powers, often getting involved in colonial conflicts, like the French and Indian War between 1754 and 1763. These alliances exposed the Cherokee to new ideas, technologies, and goods, but also brought devastating diseases and social disruption. The Cherokee population was severely affected by the introduction of European diseases like smallpox, to which they had no immunity. Epidemics led to significant population decline and social upheaval, forcing the Cherokee to adapt their traditional ways of life. In response, the Cherokee began adopting elements of European culture and technology, like farming methods, clothing, and housing styles. In the late 18th century, the Cherokee faced increasing pressures from European-American settlers who sought to expand their territories westward. 
As a result, a series of treaties were signed between the Cherokee Nation and the U.S., resulting in land cessions and the relocation of many Cherokee people. This period of displacement and forced migration was marked by internal conflict and power struggles within the Cherokee Nation. In the late 1700s and early 1800s, several Cherokee leaders emerged, such as Doublehead, Little Turkey, and later John Ross, who sought to navigate the complex political landscape and maintain Cherokee sovereignty. Many Cherokee embraced elements of European-American culture and governance, culminating in the adoption of a written constitution in 1827, which established a democratic government with executive, legislative, and judicial branches. In the midst of these tumultuous times, Sequoia was born. His life and accomplishments would ultimately play a pivotal role in preserving Cherokee language and culture during this period of rapid change and adversity. Sequoia's early life was shaped by the circumstances and customs of the Cherokee people during his time. Born around 1770 in that Cherokee town of Tuskegee in what is now Tennessee, Sequoia again had a Cherokee mother, Wute, and a European-American father, Nathaniel Gist. Sequoia's father was absent for most of his life, and so he was raised by his mother in, tr in the traditional Cherokee culture. Life for a typical Cherokee child during Sequoia's time revolved around the customs, values, and beliefs of the Cherokee people. Family and clan affiliations played a vital role in his upbringing. Cherokee society was matrilineal, meaning that children belonged to their mother's clan, and clan relationships helped define social connections, responsibilities, and inheritance. Cherokee children were raised in close-knit communities, surrounded by extended family members. They were taught to respect their elders and value cooperation and collective well-being. Children learned from their parents and other community members through observation, storytelling, and hands-on experiences. Boys and girls were trained in the skills and knowledge that they would need as adults. Boys learned how to hunt, how to fish, and basic agricultural skills, as well as warfare and defense techniques. They were taught to make and use tools and weapons. Girls learned how to cook, to weave, to sew, and they were responsible for cultivating crops like corn, beans, and squash. As they grew older, girls were taught to manage their household and care for their future families. Cherokee children were also introduced to their people's spiritual beliefs and practices. They participated in ceremonies and rituals, which emphasized the connection between the Cherokee people and the natural world. Respect for nature, ancestors, and the spirit world was deeply ingrained in Cherokee culture. Despite being raised in this traditional environment, Sequoia's life took a unique path due to his physical disability. He was believed to be lame, which limited his ability to participate in some traditional activities like hunting or warfare. As a result, Sequoia focused on developing other skills like craftsmanship. He became a skilled silversmith and blacksmith, trades that would later serve as the foundation for his monumental achievement of creating the Cherokee syllabary. So how did he actually make this syllabary? Sequoia's creation of the Cherokee syllabary was a remarkable achievement, born out of his vision to enable the Cherokee to communicate in writing and thereby strengthen their culture and identity. The development of the syllabary was a laborious and systematic process that took place over several years, culminating in the early 1820s. Initially, Sequoia experimented with a system that used symbols to represent entire words or ideas. However, he quickly realized that this approach would require the memorization of thousands of symbols, making it impractical for widespread adoption. Sequoia then shifted his focus to developing a system that could represent the individual syllables of the Cherokee language, which would be more efficient and accessible. Sequoia spent years carefully analyzing the Cherokee language, breaking it down into its constituent sounds. He identified 85 distinct syllables that could represent all possible combinations of the language's sounds. For each syllable, Sequoia created a unique character, drawing inspiration from various sources, including English, Greek, and symbols that he invented himself. The resulting syllabary was a system in which each symbol represented a consonant and a vowel sound, allowing for the efficient representation of spoken Cherokee in written form. As Sequoia worked on the syllabary, he faced skepticism and opposition from his community. Many believed that this project was a waste of time, or even a form of witchcraft. Despite these challenges, Sequoia remained steadfast in his pursuit, eventually teaching his daughter Ayoka how to read and write using his new system. Demonstrating his syllabary's effectiveness to his family and friends, Sequoia gradually gained support and recognition for his groundbreaking work. In 1821, Sequoia presented the Cherokee syllabary to the Cherokee Nation's leaders, showcasing its ability to accurately represent the spoken language in writing. The syllabary was quickly embraced, and within a few years it became widely adopted by the Cherokee people. The rapid spread of literacy was a testament to the simplicity and effectiveness of Sequoia's system, transforming the Cherokee Nation and its relationship with the written word. 
The adoption of the syllabary had far-reaching implications for the Cherokee people. It facilitated communication, record-keeping, and governance, ultimately leading to the establishment of the Cherokee Phoenix, the first Native American bilingual newspaper, in 1828. The syllabary also played a role in the development and ratification of the Cherokee Nation's constitution in 1827, which solidified their government structure and asserted their sovereignty. So let's learn more about the establishment of the Cherokee Phoenix. How was it printed, developed, and how did it use the syllabary? As I said, it was the first Native American bilingual newspaper, and it was established in 1828 by the Cherokee Nation. The newspaper played a significant role in the Cherokee people's efforts to adapt to European American culture while preserving their own identity and promoting their sovereignty. The Cherokee Phoenix was printed in both English and the Cherokee language, utilizing Sequoia's Cherokee syllabary, making it an essential tool for communication, education, and cultural preservation. Elias Bodineau, a young, educated Cherokee who had been educated in mission schools and who was fluent in both English and Cherokee, was appointed as the first editor of the Cherokee Phoenix. Boudinot was a strong advocate for the Cherokee people and used the newspaper as a platform to express his concerns and aspirations, as well as to counteract misconceptions and stereotypes about Native Americans. The printing of the Cherokee Phoenix was made possible by the, the, by the development of a printing press that could accommodate the Cherokee syllabary. In 1827, the Cherokee Nation allocated funds to purchase a printing press and type for the newspaper. The American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, an organization involved in missionary work among Native tribes, agreed to provide technical assistance in the form of a printer, Samuel Worcester. Worcester, a missionary and an advocate for the Cherokee people, collaborated with the Cherokee Nation to create the type, to create the type for the Cherokee syllabary. The printing press and type were ordered from Boston, and once they arrived, the Cherokee Phoenix began its operation in New Dakota, the capital of the Cherokee Nation. The newspaper was printed weekly, with one side featuring articles, editorials, and news in English, and the other side containing the same content in the Cherokee language using Sequoia syllabary. This bilingual format allowed the Cherokee Phoenix to reach a diverse audience, including both Cherokee and European-American readers. The Cherokee Phoenix played a vital role in informing the Cherokee people about current events, legal issues, and government affairs, both within the Cherokee Nation and the U.S. at large. It also provided educational materials in the Cherokee language, promoting literacy and cultural preservation among the Cherokee people. Additionally, the newspaper served as a platform for the Cherokee Nation to voice their concerns and opinions on issues affecting their community, such as land disputes and the threat of forced relocation. Thus, the establishment of the Cherokee Phoenix was an essential milestone in the Cherokee Nation's efforts to adapt to Euro-American culture. By utilizing Sequoia syllabary, the newspaper played a crucial role in fostering literacy and education. So, a totally different question. How did Sequoia's name get attached to the tree? Sequoia's name became attached to the tree species Sequoia dendron giganteum, also known as the giant sequoia, basically due to a misunderstanding and mis misattribution. The giant sequoia is one of the largest tree species in the world, native to the Sierra Nevada mountain range in California. The connection between sequoia and the giant sequoia tree is an interesting, albeit co coincidental, aspect of history. In 1847, Austrian botanist Stefan Endlicher described and named the tree species in honor of sequoia, although the two have no direct connection. It's believed that Endlicher chose the name sequoia to commemorate the Native American polymath for his remarkable achievement in creating the Cherokee syllabary reflecting the unique and extraordinary nature of both sequoia and the giant sequoia tree. But some scholars argue that the naming may have just been a coincidence, and that Endlicher may have derived the name sequoia from the Latin word sequor, which means to follow. This interpretation suggests that the name sequoia was meant to indicate that the tree species was a follower or relative of the Taxodiaceae family to which it was initially assigned. Regardless of the reason, today the association exists, and the Sequoia National Park in 1890 stands as a testament to the grandeur and magnificence of these ancient trees, while also reminding visitors of the extraordinary accomplishments of Sequoia and its lasting impact on the Cherokee people. So what happened to the Cherokee after Sequoia died in 1843? Well, they continued to face significant challenges, including forced removal, land dispossession, and efforts by the U.S. government to assimilate Native tribes into Euro-American culture. For instance, the Trail of Tears between 1838 and 1839. A few years before Sequoia died, the U.S. government had passed the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which sought to forcibly relocate Native American tribes from their ancestral lands in the southeastern U.S. to designated quote-unquote Indian territory west of the Mississippi River. Despite the Cherokee Nation's legal resistance, the forced removal of the Cherokee people, known as the Trail of Tears, 
took place in 1838 to 1839. Thousands of Cherokee people died during the journey due to harsh conditions, illness, and exposure. Between 1839 and 1850, the Cherokee Nation experienced internal divisions following the Trail of Tears, with the old settlers who had moved west voluntarily before the forced removal and the latecomers who arrived after the Trail of Tears. In 1839, the two factions signed the Act of Union, which sought to reunify the Cherokee Nation. A new constitution was adopted in 1840, followed by the establishment of a new capital at Tahlequah in present-day Oklahoma. What about during the Civil War? The Cherokee Nation, like many other native tribes, was affected by the American Civil War. The Cherokee people were divided in their loyalties, with some supporting the Union and others aligning with the Confederacy. This division led to internal conflict and violence within the Cherokee Nation. After the war, the Cherokee signed a new treaty with the U.S. government in 1866, which further eroded their sovereignty and land rights. In the period of allotment and assimilation, the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the U.S. government continued its efforts to assimilate native tribes into Euro-American society. The Dawes Act of 1887 and the Curtis Act of 1898 aimed to break up communal tribal lands into individually owned allotments, thereby encouraging the adoption of European-American agricultural practices and lifestyles. These policies severely disrupted traditional Cherokee life, social structures, and land ownership. But in the last century, there have been improvements. In the face of these challenges, the Cherokee have made efforts to revitalize and preserve their culture, language, and tradition. The Cherokee Nation has reestablished its government and has worked to improve education, health care, and ec economic development for its citizens. The nation is also focused on preserving and promoting the Cherokee language through various programs, like the Cherokee Nation Immersion School, which aims to teach the language to younger generations. So while the Cherokee people have faced numerous challenges in the years following Sequoia's death, including forced removal, land dispossession, and cultural assimilation, they have persevered and they continue to work towards revital revitalizing their culture, language, and traditions while advocating for the rights and well-being of its citizens. Thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard today, please subscribe.